very good morning friends this is a very important topic that is pre operative evaluation of patient with prostate cancer surgery this i have almost uh, condensed around uh, 100 pages of uh, miller's anesthesia uh, into preparing this presentation and also i have taken many other references also so this is a very important class and, uh, and also for usually for the uh, first year post graduates it is uh, very much necessary okay so now we shall go into the details of the class so pre operative evaluation of patient first we ask for the history of the patient history what history we have to ask we have to ask for history of patient is having any chronic diseases like diabetes mellitus hypertension tuberculosis epilepsy uh, history of any jaundice is there or not any history of hemiplegia or hemiparesis and and also we have to ask for history of Uh, uh the symptoms related to the pertinent systems like for example in case of cardiovascular system you have to ask for the five cardinal symptoms related to the cardiovascular system that is patient is having any breathlessness chest pain palpitations syncopal attacks and pedal edema and also uh, symptoms related to the respiratory system or breathlessness cough with expectoration and patient is having any pedal edema related to right heart failure and also patient complaints of any chest pain that is pleuritic chest type of chest pain any history of wheeze okay all this history we have to ask in case of related to central nervous system we have to ask for any history of uh, loss of sensations or any history of weakness of limbs or uh, history of hemiplegia in case of abdominal system i had asked for any history of distension of abdomen so these are all the system uh, these are all the symptoms we ask for in patients so now history of drug history so in drug history we have to ask whether the patient is taking any drugs that is for all these treatment of diabetes mellitus hypertension or any whether patient is on any drug history and we should also ask for any history of Uh, hypersensitivity to the drugs that is any history of allergy and we should ask for any history of family family history of hereditary diseases so usually in case of vaishya community they will be having this atypical pseudo cholesterol so when we give choline in these patients that is vaishya patients there will be prolongation of the duration of action of succinyl choline because of this phase 2 blockade so that is why we should ask for history of uh this whether the patient belongs to the vaishya community or not and also in case of this northern states like this gujarat and also jharkhand few communities they will be having history of sickle cell disease we have to ask for this one and we should ask for history of alcohol intake and also tobacco use so when the patient takes alcohol that is more than 14 drinks per week so and uh, and also this uh, uh, tobacco that is cigarette smoking that is more than 20 pack years then the patient will develop this diseases like that is if the alcohol if patient takes more than 14 drinks per week then over a long period of time patient develops that is alcoholic liver disease that is alcoholic fatty liver and uh, alcoholic uh, <coughs> hepatitis and also cirrhosis of liver when the patient takes this tobacco for the more than 20 pack years what is meant by 20 pack years 20 pack years means one pack of cigarette per day for 20 years if he smokes then it is called as 20 pack years or it may be also like two packs of cigarettes per day for 10 years that is also 20 pack years only so then patients are more prone for developing that is copd that is chronic bronchitis and also emphysema now coming to this noih grading of dyspnea this noih grading that is new york heart association grading of dyspnea it is given for patients who are having heart failure so in case of class 1 class 1 dyspnea that is this is also called as asymptomatic lv dysfunction it is also called as compensated heart failure and stage grade 3 and grade 4 dyspnea that is these are considered as decompensated heart failure in case of grade 1 noih grade 1 dyspnea there is there are no limitations and uh, uh, ordinary physical activity does not cause uh, undue fatigue dyspnea or palpitations this patient is having asymptomatic lv dysfunction and the metabolic equivalents which will be discussed in the next slides it is capacity is more than 7 
in case of class 2 there is a NYHA uh, grade 2 Disney are here uh, this uh, slight limitation of physical activity is there and ordinary physical activity it results in fatigue palpitations and uh, dyspnea or angina pectoris and in case of a grade 3 here in NYHA grade 3 Disney there is marked limitation of physical activity is there and in NYHA grade 4 uh, that is dyspnea is present at rest so this NYH grade 3 and NYH grade 4 dyspnea they are called as decompensated heart failure so this medical research council grading of dyspnea this medical MRC grading of dyspnea it is used for dyspnea grading in patients who are having respiratory diseases here MRC grade on dyspnea that is the patient is not troubled by breathlessness except on strenuous activity and in MRC grade 2 dyspnea patient complains of breathlessness while hurrying on the ground on level or walking up uphill and in case of grade 3 dyspnea patient uh, walks slower than most of the people of his age group and he stops after a mile or so or after 15 minutes of walking at his own pace in case of grade 4 when patient walks for more than 100 yards then he has to stop for taking breath or uh, patient develops dyspnea after walking for a few minutes on level ground and grade 5 dyspnea this patient is too breath to leave the house or patient is breathless when eating when talking and also when undressing <coughs> Now coming to this metabolic equivalents. In this metabolic equivalents, we have to remember this metabolic equivalent one. All these are not necessary. So this metabolic equivalent one is that is equivalent of, uh, level of exercise is eating, working, and also dressing. And metabolic equivalent of five is patient is able to climb one flight of stairs, is able to dance, and also do bicycling. And metabolic equivalent of seven is playing single tennis metabolic equivalent of 10 is swimming quickly metabolic equivalent of 12 is patient is able to run uh, moderate to long distances rapidly so this is the metabolic so whenever you ask for any history of functional capacity that is whether patient is able to climb one flight of stairs it means the metabolic equivalent capacity it is more than five Now coming to this Duke Activity Specific Index Questionnaire. In Duke Activity Specific Index Questionnaire, here uh, points are given according to the different types of activity and we have to ask all these. That is, patient can take care of himself or not, patient is able to walk indoors or not, and uh, he can walk 200 yards on level ground, he can climb a flight of stairs or walk up a hill and a patient can run for a short distance or not and do light work so and do heavy work having uh, sexual relations and participating in moderate rec recreational activity like golf so all these based upon this you have to remember this duke activity specific index questionnaire so based upon the specific activities points are given and all these points are added up and we can calculate based upon these points what is the metabolic equivalence now coming to the general physical examination in general physical examination we have to do head to toe examination in head to toe examination we have to look for pictures pallor cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy and pedal edema and also any other uh, manifestations skin manifestations of diseases we can see like for example patient may be having erythema marginatum or patient may be having any uh, this uh, uh, hemangiomas over the face or patient may be having any uh, um, uh, petechial hemorrhages all this and uh, dupitrans contracture and parotid enlargement loss of axillary hair loss of secondary sexual characters all these are all part of physical exam general physical examination now coming to assessment of vitals in vitals we have to see that is pulse blood pressure respiratory rate and temperature so a pulse we have to see that there is a radial pulse we have to check for if there is any radio radial or radio femoral delay is there and a blood pressure we have to measure the blood pressure in with the patient in sitting position in the right arm and also we have to check both the upper limb blood pressure and also uh, lower limb blood pressure also we have to check 
Now this airway assessment. Airway assessment. It is uh, very important for the anesthesiologist. This airway assessment. Here, uh, uh, what is the mouth opening? We have to see what amount of mouth opening there is. The interincisor distance is important. If it is less than three centimeters, it indicates a difficult intubation. And patient is having an anterior teeth. That is also anterior incisors. Also a difficult intubation. Balam pati grade three, grade four is a difficult intubation. Upper lip bite test that is grade two and grade three is a difficult intubation. High arched palate, neck circumference more than 43 centimeters, thyromental distance less than six centimeters, and a non-compliant submandibular space. And the patient having restriction of neck movements. All these indicate patient having difficult intubation. So when do you tell patient is having a difficult mask ventilation? Difficult mask ventilation that is when a patient is edentulous, that is absent teeth or there. So we will be unable to make a tight seal between the uh, face and also the mask ventilation. And also whenever the patient is having beard, so then also we will be having difficult this back mask ventilation. So this is the malampati grading. In case of malampati grading, that is grade one, that is here. The the pillars are visible. The fossas, the tip of the vula, and uh, soft palate and hard palate are visible. In a, a malampati grade two, there is only the base of the vula, the pillars, pa part of fossas, and uh, uh, soft palate and hard palate are visible. In uh, malampati grade three, only soft palate and hard palate are visible. In grade four, only hard palate is visible. So grade three and grade four are difficult intubation. Now coming to this upper lip bite test. This upper lip bite test here, the patient is asked to bite the upper lip with the lower incisors. If the patient is able to bite the upper lip above the vermilion line, then it is called as class one. Is able to bite the Upper lip below the vermilion line, then it is class two. If it is not able to bite the upper lip, then it is class three. That is called as lower incisors cannot bite the upper lip. So class two and class three are difficult intubation. Now coming to systemic examination. In systemic examination, we have to examine the systems that is cardiovascular system. Any presence of any abnormal heart sounds and also murmurs and respiratory system. How is the bilateral air entry and any added sounds? And in the central nervous system, that is high ornamental functions and motor and also sensory system examination and also abdomen examination. Also, we have to do. Now coming to various risk indices. So one of the most important risk indices is the revised cardiac risk index. In this revised cardiac in risk index so score that is points are assigned for uh, individual components that is patient is posted for any high risk surgery that is intraperitoneal or intrathoracic surgery or supra inguinal uh, vascular surgery and the patient is having any history of ischemic heart disease history of cerebrovascular disease and the history of congestive heart failure and um, history of diabetes mellitus, history of uh, renal failure, all these are given points of one. So one, two, three, four, five, and six um, uh, parameters are there. So when the score is zero, when the revised cardiac risk index score is zero, then the risk of major cardiac events is less than 0.4%. And when the revised cardiac risk index uh, RCRA score is more than three, then the risk of major cardiac events perioperatively, it goes up to the tune of 5.4 percent this goldman cardiac risk index in this goldman cardiac index the scoring is given according to points are given according to individual parameters that is the third heart sound and elevated jvp mi in, in the previous six months and uh, this ecg that is uh, premature atrial contractions or rhythm other than sinus rhythm more than five premature ventricular contractions and age is more than 70 years and uh, emergency procedure, intrathoracic, intra-abdominal or aortic surgery and poor general condition or a uh, bedridden patient. So in all the, the, these we have points are given. So based upon this, um, there is a Goldman cardiac index risk scoring is done. So when the score is less than 6, then the risk of death is 0.2%. Perioperative mortality risk is less than 0.2%. If it is between 6 to 25, then the risk of perioperative mortality risk is less than 
four uh, percent. If it is more than twenty-five score, then the uh, perioperative mortality risk is up to the tune of fifty-six percent. No, no, the perioperative ECG. So, in which patient we have to order for perioperative ECG? In patients usually who are more than forty-five years, one thing, and patients who are having any history of ischemic heart disease. And uh, cerebrovascular disease, congestive heart failure, patient who are having uh, history of any arrhythmia, and also structural heart disease. All these are the indications for preoperative ECG. Preoperative two day echo is advised in patients who are having any history of ischemic heart disease, dyspnea of unknown origin, history of uh, heart failure is there, or whenever this two uh, day echo is done more than one year back, and also heart murmur is there. So this is the cardiac anesthesia risk evaluation score. This cardiac anesthesia risk evaluation score is done in patients who are posted for open heart surgeries. So score one here, score one is given to patients who are having a stable cardiac disease and they are posted for a non-complex surgery. And score two is given for patients who are having a stable cardiac disease with a mild systemic disease, or which is controlled. Um, that is one or more controlled medical problems. and score 3 is given for patients who are having any uncontrolled medical problem or in any patient in whom complex surgery is undertaken score 4 is given in patients who are having uncontrolled medical problem and a complex surgery is undertaken and uh, a care score 5 is given in patients who are where there is advanced cardiac disease and in whom cardiac surgery is undertaken as a last hope to uh, to save the patient okay now this cardiac stress testing this is very uh, important uh, because few patients uh, in, if the patient if you are able to assess the preoperative functional capacity of the patient by history then it is well and good if the if we are not able to assess the functional capacity of the patient or when the functional capacity of the patient is less for example that is when the metabolic equivalent it is less than 4 metabolic equivalents or uncertain functional capacity such as in case of bedridden patients and also orthopedic patients and patients who are having severe osteoarthritis who are not able to walk where the functional capacity of the patient cannot be assessed in these patients this cardiac stress testing is recommended by american heart association so how is this done this cardiac stress testing is done either by exercise testing or by pharmacological stress testing exercise testing is done in patients who are able to walk and who are able to uh, do the treadmill and pharmacological stress testing is done in patients who are not able to walk or who are bedridden in case of uh, before going to this one uh, details we should know what is the maximum heart rate in a patient maximum heart rate in a patient is equal to 220 minus age is a maximum heart rate so this 85% of this maximum heart rate is called as a target heart rate so we have to make the patient exercise so that the target heart rate is reached that is 85% of this uh, maximum heart rate so so or uh, we can give pharmacological agents like this dobutamine dipyridamol adenosine Uh, is given and ecg 2d echo and also myocardial perfusion imaging is done uh, in order to assess uh, what is the amount of the viable myocardium so the gold standard test to honor to assess whether the patient is having any ischemic heart disease or not is this invasive coronary angiography and less alternatively the ct coronary angiography is also done nowadays and in this in patients who have undergone stent it uh, it may be uh, it will be preferred uh, uh, to repeat angiogram after 5 years in a patient who is having stent now coming to preoperative bnp levels so what are these bnp levels bnp level the bnp means it is brain natriuretic peptide so this brain natriuretic peptide levels are increased in patients who are having cardiac failure so in who are these cardiac failure patients so that is uh, 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 this bnp levels if it is less than 99 nanograms per liter then the risk of uh, uh, 
MI or uh, death the perioperative risk of MI or death is 0.4 percent and when uh, the, uh, the value is 100 to 250 nanograms per liter then the risk is 1.5 percent and if it is more than 250 uh, nanograms per liter BNP levels then uh, the uh, likelihood ratio for death or MI it may go up to the tune of uh, 5 percent okay and now coming to this bedside pulmonary function test so whenever the patient complains of breathlessness or patient is having any history of respiratory diseases past history of respiratory diseases or uh, that is like tuberculosis history of fibrosis of lung is there a patient is having any history of uh, uh, this uh, uh, to, um, tobacco uh, smoking so in these patients this bedside pulmonary function test will be helpful uh, in order to assess what is the respiratory status of the patient. So the first is that is the SABRIS is breath holding time. So normal breath holding time it, it goes uh, it, yeah, that is normal it is more than uh, 25 to 40 seconds. So if it is uh, 15 to 25 seconds it indicates uh, moderate cardio respiratory compromises there. If it is less than 15 seconds it indicates severe respiratory cardiorespiratory compromise and the Schneider's matchstick blowing test. In the Schneider's matchstick blowing test the patient is asked to blow off a match from a distance of 15 centimeters uh, with the mouth wide open. If he is able to do so then it indicates the maximum breathing capacity of more than 60 liters per minute and FEV1 is more than 1.6 liters and this forced expiratory time this is the forced expiratory time normal it is uh, three to five seconds if it is more than six seconds it indicates uh, obstructive lung disease if it is less than three seconds it indicates restrictive lung disease so now coming to this single breath count we have a single breath count uh, it indicates what is the vital capacity of the patient so a deep breath is taken and then the patient will count the numbers from 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 so like that patient has to count the numbers as uh, uh, as far as he can without taking breath in between so this is called as single breath count normal is 30 to 40 count is taken as normal and now uh, one more is a bedside instrument this is the Wright's peak flow meter this uh, is a very handy and a bedside instrument which is used to measure the peak expiratory flow rate so the normal peak expiratory flow rate is 450 to 700 liters per minute in adult males and 350 to 500 liters per minute in adult females so now if the patient is posted for lung resection we should know whether the patient uh, can be posted for lung resection whether the patient can undergo a lobectomy pneumonectomy or segmentectomy there are few minimum criteria that is the cutoff criteria before the patient can be posted for pneumonectomy lobectomy or segmentectomy if the patient has to be posted for pneumonectomy then his uh, maximum voluntary ventilation it should be more than 70 liters per minute and uh, MVV that is maximum voluntary ventilation it should be more than 55 percent of predicted FEV1 should be more than uh, 1.7 to 2.1 liters and FEV1 uh, it should be more than 50 percent of the vital capacity and uh, uh, force expiratory volume 25 to 75 percent it should be more than 1.6 liters for lobectomy FEV1 it should be more than 1.0 to 1.2 liters and FEV1 should be more than 40 percent of the forced vital capacity and for segmental resection uh, FEV1 should be more than 0.6 to 0.9 liters and FEV1 should be more than 40 percent of the forced vital capacity. So now how to calculate this predicted post-operative FEV1. So before the patient is posted for uh, this uh, that is lung resection surgeries we should also know what is this what will be the post-operative FEV1 so we can predict how we can predict is so this lung is divided into uh, this 42 subsegments that is a uh, right lung it has got 22 and left lung has got 20 subsegments based upon the amount of the lung that is resected it is calculated for example if the patient undergoes a right lower lobectomy that is 12 seg segments are being removed so the post-operative FEV1 decrease it will be equal to 12 divided by 42 so that is 29% decrease in the uh, FEV1 will be there 
So and also this predicted post-operative AV V1 that one will be equal to 1 minus suppose segment 1 minus seg segments removed that is equal to 12 divided by 42. So that will be equal to uh, into pre-operative V1. So that gives what is the predicted post-operative V1. One thing what we have to remember is the minimum predicted post-operative V1 value which is approximately 800 ml for lung resection because when the FE V1 is less than 800 ml or 800 to 1000 ml then the patient will not be able to cough out the secretions and hence patient will be having retention of secretions and atelectasis and patient will develop lower respiratory tract infection and, and also need for post-operative ventilatory support will be there. Now one thing we have to remember is that is a gold standard test to assess cardiorespiratory uh, fun functional capacity. So that is the cardiopulmonary exercise test. So this cardiopulmonary exercise test, it is an expensive test and it is also time taking. So uh, as a less alternative methods or as a surrogative methods, uh, other tests like the six minute walk test is used. In six minute walk test, there is a 30 minute hallway is there and the patient is asked to walk for a duration of six minutes. The patient has to walk as fast and as far as possible in this duration of six minutes. And during this period, heart rate, blood pressure and saturation is measured. And uh, this VO2 max can be calculated. So how this VO2 max is calculated means, so the distance walked in meters for example, if the patient walks around 600 meters in 6 minutes divided by 30. So that is equal to, so 600 by 30 is equal to 20. So this VO2 max is equal to 20 ml per kg per minute. What is meant by VO2 max? VO2 max is maximum oxygen consumption. So the oxygen consumption at rest in a normal adult is 3.5 ml per kg per minute. And uh, maximum oxygen consumption is 35 to 40 ml per kg per minute in a sedentary adult and in patients who are athletes it will be up to 85 ml per kg per minute. So this increased risk is present whenever this VO2 max is less than 15 ml per kg per minute and also during this 6 minute walk test we have to see whether there is any drop in SpO2 is there or not. So when the drop in SpO2 is more than 4% during exercise then it also indicates a high risk. And VO2 max is less than 10 ml per kg per minute it indicates very high risk. So as I told previously this is the cardiopulmonary exercise testing and it is the most reliable and the gold standard test for evaluation of functional capacity of the patient. In this patient uh, he does exercise on a static cycle or on a treadmill and initially without resistance and gradually the resistance is increased and the airflow is measured using pneumotachograph and the exercise duration is 6 to 10 minutes. So what are the, all the parameters measured are here? That is VO2, that is oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide production, that is VCO2, respiratory exchange ratio and this anaerobic threshold and also cardiovascular parameters like heart rate, ECG and NIBP, SpO2 are measured and ventilation parameters like minute ventilation, tidal volume, respiratory rate, minute ventilation to oxygen consumption ratio, minute ventilation to carbon dioxide production ratio and uh, uh, CO2 in the expired air and also oxygen in the expired air. All these parameters are measured and also the anaerobic threshold is measured. So anaerobic threshold it is defined as the oxygen that is VO2, VO2 at which anaerobic metabolism starts. How do we know that anaerobic metabolism is started? Means uh, whenever this anaerobic metabolism starts then the, uh, the slope of VCO2 it exceeds that of VO2 and respiratory exchange ratio it exceeds 1 respiratory exchange ratio exceeds 1. So that means this, this slope of VCO2 exceeds that of VO2. And here one thing we have to remember is during all this exercise what happens is the, there is an increase in oxygen extraction because of the right side shift of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve there is an increase in oxygen extraction during exercise. But 
what happens during the post operative period in the post operative period there is not much increase in the oxygen extraction ratio but the oxygen consumption is increased by 50% so in order to compensate for this increase in oxygen consumption by 50% the the cardiac output it has to increase by 2 and of folds okay. so this one uh, that is why there is more stress on the cardiac and the respiratory system in the immediate perioperative period so this as i told previously the oxygen consumption maximum oxygen consumption less than 15 ml per kg per minute and also this anaerobic threshold less than 11 ml per kg per minute it indicates high risk so when do we tell patient is Uh, there is a high risk of uh, uh, perioperative pulmonary complications so that is whenever patient is having any history of obstructive lung disease or there is low functional capacity is there and patient is having advanced age low preoperative oxygen saturation and upper abdominal and also thoracic surgery when the duration of surgery is more than 3 hours and patient is having low respiratory tract infection or abnormal chest x ray is there and also history of cigarette smoking is there all these are uh, predictors of high risk of uh, post operative pulmonary complications now coming to abnormal lft patient is having abnormal lft and he is posted for surgery so how do you go about so in this abnormal lft uh, there is the enzymes are abnormal there is sgpt and sgot are abnormal this sgpt is also Well, the ALT and SGOT is AST. So that is alanine amino transferase and aspartate amino transferase. So if the rise in this LFT, that is, is enzymes, if it is less than two times normal, then you go, you do other tests like what is the alkaline phosphatase, bilirubin, and the INR. If all these are normal, then proceed with surgery. If uh, these uh, values are more than two times normal. the normal uh, value is around 0 to 35 units per liter if it is more than two times normal then we have to rule out any history of drug intake that is patient uh, uh, rule out uh, um, isoniazid or uh, uh, any uh, patient uh, taking alcohol all this uh, history we have to uh, rule out and also we have to repeat the test That is, if you repeat the test, if it is still more than two times normal, uh, these uh, enzymes are more than two times normal, then we have to go for formal testing. That is, we have to do that is viral screening, HCV and also HBCG, and uh, CT scan of abdomen may be required, and also liver biopsy also may be required. And if it is uh, less than uh, two times normal, then we can proceed with surgery. so if there is increase in alkaline phosphatase how we should go about the alkaline phosphatase is increased but rest of all the parameters are normal that is uh, this there is alkaline phosphatase rise is less than two times normal and this hgot sgpt and bilirubin and ggt are all normal then we can proceed with surgery if alkaline phosphatase if it is more than two times normal and uh, this uh, Uh, abnormal GGT, GGT and bilirubin is there. Then it indicates biliary disease, obstructive jaundice. So we have to do formal assessment before surgery. So now coming to this assessment of risk in patients who are having the cirrhosis of liver or there is alcoholic liver disease. There is there is child Turcotte Pook classification. Here five parameters are assessed and a scoring of one, two, three are given according to that. So depending upon this. the parameters are there is ascites bilirubin there is uh, albumin and also prothrombin time and also encephalopathy so if the uh, score total score is more than 9 then the risk of mortality is perioperative mortality is more than 76% within 6 months and if the score is between 6 to 9 mortality risk is 31% if it is less than 6 then the mortality risk is less than 10% the disadvantage with the child turcotte book criteria is it doesn't take into account the serum creatinine so this model for end stage liver disease has been developed the scoring of a model for end stage disease is there so in this uh, uh, mmld scoring here serum bilirubin inr and also creatinine are also is also taken into account 
here this is value is equal to 3.78 into ln this is the natural logarithm of serum will win plus 11.2 into natural logarithm of uh, inr plus 9.57 into natural logarithm of serum creatine plus 6.43 so when the score is more than 40 then the risk of mortality is more than 70 percent and the score is less than 9 and the risk of mortality is less than 2 percent so what are the risk factors for post-operative renal failure when do you tell uh, high risk for renal failure we have to take uh, because some many times we have to take consent where that uh, risk of preoperative renal failure will be there so in case of old patients old age patients already patients who are having heart failure in diabetes patients patients who are on inotropic support and also patients who are on, uh, undergoing uh, major surgeries like intrathoracic and also intra-abdominal surgeries emergency surgeries and patients who have undergone blood transfusion and aortic cross clamp time and uh, cardiopulmonary bypass time it is uh, more than two hours all these are increases factors for post-operative renal failure when the patient is having thyroid disease what we have to assess we should ask for history of what is the duration of the illness whether the patient is having uh, hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism symptoms are there what is the treatment patient is taking what is the duration of treatment when was the last thyroid function test done all this we have to know and if the tests are done within six months and the patient condition is stable then we need not repeat the test and also ask for any history of symptoms like pressure symptoms such as dysphagia and uh, dyspnea and also change in voice and we should check for any retrosternal extension is there or not because when the retrosternal extension of thyroid is there and also compression of trachea is there then the entire plan of anesthesia management will be different that is we have to go for awake nasal intubation or we have to go for uh, awake fiber optic intubation or inhalational induction of anesthesia and intubation with spontaneous ventilation of the patient has to be done and also we have to go for uh, pre-operative examination of vocal cords so because post-operatively um, uh, less frequently we, we may uh, come across this uh, recurrent laryngeal or palsies in the case of post-operative period so pre-operative the vocal cord examination is necessary for medical legal purpose now coming to assessment that is pre-operative evaluation in a patient with diabetes mellitus. In the diabetes mellitus, we should know what is the duration of history patient is suffering from diabetes mellitus, what is the treatment patient is taking and uh, how the control is there, uh, whether it is uh, well controlled or not and patient is having any macrovascular or my, uh, microvascular complications and also any history of suggestive of autonomic dysfunction is there or not. Uh, that is autonomic neuropathy in case of autonomic neuropathy patient will be having orthostatic hypotension that is as soon as the patient uh, takes this uh, uh, standing position from supine position that the patient will be having a blackout or a loss of uh, consciousness and decreased excess tolerance will be there gastroparesis there is nausea vomiting bloating and diarrhea and constipation will be there and also uh, we should see for any difficult uh, intubation uh, signs or there. that is the prayer sign patient is asked to approximate the palmar aspect of her hands and also the fingers if the patient is, a, is not able to approximate the palmar aspect of the fingers then it indicates a difficult intubation so now how do you assess this autonomic neuropathy what are the tests for autonomic neuropathy there are both sympathetic tests and parasympathetic tests in case of uh, sympathetic tests we have got that is the test for blood pressure in case of test for blood pressure patient has to do a sustained hand grip and uh, the blood pressure is measured if the, blood, the diastolic blood pressure if it increases by more than 16 millimeter of mercury then it is normal if the rise in diastolic blood pressure is less than 10 millimeter of mercury it is abnormal means patient is having diabetic autonomic neuropathy and now coming to this postural hypertension in supine position blood pressure is measured and again patient is asked to uh, take the standing position then blood pressure is measured if the difference between the supine and the standing blood pressure if it is more than 30 millimeter of mercury it indicates orthostatic hypotension so normally the the difference in blood pressure it should be less than 10 millimeter of mercury now coming to the parasympathetic test in a parasympathetic test here we uh, assess the uh, heart rate variability to deep breathing so normal uh, uh, heart rate variability to deep breathing is uh, it is more than 15 beats per minute 
if it is less than 10 bits per minute then it is abnormal and and also to this standing what is what is the response so what the normal response is when the patient uh, takes a standing position from supine position to standing position then there is a compensatory increase in heart rate so whenever there is increase in heart rate what will happen the rr interval it will decrease so the rr interval at 15th beat after attaining the standing position is taken and the RR interval at 30th beat after taking the standing position is taken. So the RR interval at the 30th beat it would have increased because that compensated response would have settled by then and so after immediately after the patient takes this standing position there is an increase in heart rate so there is a decrease in RR interval so this uh, heart rate in increases up to this 15th beat after the 15th beat uh, th there is a decrease in the heart rate so there is a decrease in heart rate and this and and hence rr interval will increase so the ratio of the rr interval at the 30th beat to the rr interval at the 15th beat so here after attaining this standing position when this ratio is taken the normal it should be more than 1.04 if it is less than 1.01 it indicates autonomic dysfunction and also we have to check for neurological deficits in patient in patients with diabetes mellitus we should also know what is the fbs what is the postprandial blood sugar what is the uh, uh, hba1c levels and also if the sugar is more than 200 and random blood sugar is more than 250 we, have, we should get for urine ketone bodies and see we should also know what is serum creatinine ecg and also electrolytes now coming to assessment in a patient who is who is obese. So the body mass index, normal body mass index is 18.5 to 25. Uh, less than 18.5 is underweight and uh, 25 to 29.9 is overweight and 30 and above is obese and more than 40 is morbidly obese. So in case of obese patients, they have got uh, multiple problems it, it involves almost most of the systems like cardio respiratory compromise will be more in case of obese patients so these obese patients what will happen because of this obesity accumulation of the fat in the neck and also uh, what will happen these patients they will face uh, uh, this obstructive sleep apnea symptoms so during sleep there will be drop in saturation there is a collapse of the airway will be there and there is a drop in saturation and uh, frequent apnea and hyperpnea, uh, hypopnea episodes will be there. So based upon the, this uh, uh, frequency of uh, uh, apneic and hypopnic episodes, it is the, the, uh, classified as uh, mild uh, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome when the apneic episodes are 5 to 15 per hour and moderate as when the apneic episodes are 16 to 30 per hour and severe as when the apneic episodes are more than 30 per hour and so when uh, when the patient is having symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea usually patient will be having daytime drowsiness and the patient will tell I, I don't feel fresh when i get up in the morning that is daytime drowsiness will be there history of snoring will be there and also hypertension will be there and this uh, uh, can be assessed by using this polysomnography and also home sleep apnea testing this obstructive sleep apnea can be diagnosed and this obesity sleep uh, obesity uh, sleep hypoventilation syndrome is also called as a peak weekend syndrome this peak weekend syndrome that is obesity will be there hypoventilation will be there and also pulmonary hypertension will be there now coming to this metabolic syndrome these patients with central obesity also suffer from metabolic syndrome metabolic syndrome is obesity with hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia then uh, increased risk for uh, this diabetes and also heart diseases and uh, hypertension uh, all these uh, all metabolic syndrome they are also at increased risk for dementia and polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome and uh, cancer and also non-alcoholic fatty liver disease now coming to assessment of a elderly patient 
So when the age is more than 65 years, then you call it a geriatric patient. Not all geriatric patients are high risk. It all depends upon what is the exercise capacity of the patient. So what is the we have to assess what is the exercise capacity of the patient. So based upon that, we can tell whether the patient is frail or not. So elderly frail patient, you tell the patient the elderly patient as frail when there is an unintentional weight loss of more than 5 kg in one year is there or when your patient complains of exhaustion, most or moderate uh, duration of the time and there is low physical activity is there and uh, patient or slow walkers, there is a decreased power and also decreased grip strength is there and serum albumin is less than 3 grams per deciliter and timed up and go test if it is more than 50 seconds, 15 seconds. Time In timed up and go test, patient is asked to get up from the chair, walk for 10 feet, come back and again sit in the same chair. So if this timed up and go test, if it takes more than 50, 15 seconds, then that means patient is a slow walker and also his uh, capacity is less and uh, uh, so they, they are called as elder, frail patients. Coming to these neurological disorders. In neurological disorders, we should ask for the history of any cerebrovascular accident is there or not. And we should check for uh, carotid brui. If carotid brui is there, then we have to order for a carotid Doppler study. And also ask for any history of seizure disorder. What type of seizure disorder is having? Patient is having general tonic clonic seizures or absent seizures. What type of medication is taking? Usually these medications, they cause a hyponatremia and this microcytic anemia, leukopenia and also bone marrow depression. So all these also we have to know. Now coming to this connective tissue disorders. Uh, of this connective tissue disorders, uh, uh, most important for the anesthesiologist is the rheumatic uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, usually they, uh, they may be having difficult airway because of restricted mouth opening due to temporomandibular joint arthritis and also this uh, narrowing of the glottic opening due to cricoarytenoid arthritis. And also this patient may be having atlantoaxial subluxation, uh, so which leads to this uh, anterior atlanto dense interval which is more than 9 mm and also because of this what happens whenever we do neck extension then the risk of cervical spinal cord injury is more because of this atlanto axial subluxation. Now coming to this American Society of Anesthesiologists physical status classification. So ASA grade 1 is a normal healthy patient both clinically and also by investigation wise patient is healthy. ASA grade 2 patient that is patient is having a mild systemic disease which is under control that is diabetes mellitus or hypertension which is controlled and ASA grade 3 uh, systemic disease which is not under control that is uncontrolled diabetes mellitus or uncontrolled hypertension and ASA grade 4 is patient having a systemic disease which is a constant threat to life that is patient who is having an unstable angina or patient is having a uh, uh, decompensated heart failure and in case of ASA grade 5 here a moribund patient who is not expected to survive without operation and ASA grade 6 is a brain dead patient whose organs are being removed for donor purposes. So this is all about the ASA grading classification. Now, according to this uh, 2014 uh, uh, American Heart Association guidelines, where there are a few definitions, that is, what is an emergency surgery? Emergency surgery or emergency procedure is as one where the life or uh, uh, the limb would be threatened if the surgery is not proceeded within six hours. And urgent procedure is defined as one where life or limb of the individual is threatened if surgery is not proceeded within 6 to 24 hours. And time sensitive procedure is defined as one where delay exceeding 1 to 6 weeks, it can adverse the outcome of the patient, that is in whenever in case of oncology procedures. And according, this is uh, the Uh, this is the um, classification of uh, surgeries which is given by Indian Society of Anesthesiologists based upon the invasiveness and also duration of surgery. So minor surgeries are all the superficial surgeries. There is uh, any skin grafting, fibroadenoma and uh, patient is posted for any cataract surgery, urological surgeries, hemorrhoidectomy and debridement surgeries and uh, DNC. Uh, 
uh, closed fracture reduction so all these come under minor surgeries and major surgeries are uh, in case here there is arthroscopic surgeries and uh, replacement surgeries and uh, femur fracture fixation and uh, the radical hysterectomy total thyroidectomy and the neck dissection modified radical mastectomy all these come under uh, these major surgeries and intermediate risk surgeries are we, here we get this laparoscopic uh, uh, appendicectomy and cholecystectomy inguinal hernia surgery and uh, 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 simple that is uh, hemithyroidectomies and uh, benign hysterectomy and uh, uh, tibia and also forearm fractures transurethral resection of prostate uh, all these uh, are uh, <coughs> intermediate risk uh, surgeries this is the john hopkins surgery risk classification system in this one uh, surgeries are classified uh, based upon this uh, uh, the invasiveness of the procedure so that is category one here minimal risk to the patient uh, minimal risk to the patient is there and also little or no blood loss is there so and uh, here in case of a category two uh, mild to uh, minimal to moderate invasive procedure and the blood loss is less than 500 ml in category three here moderate to significant uh, invasive procedure blood loss is 500 to 1500 ml in uh, category 4 uh, blood loss is more than 1500 ml and highly invasive procedure and in case of category 5 that is the uh, invasive procedure highly invasive procedure and also patient requires post operative um, monitoring and also critical care support and the blood loss is more than 1500 ml <coughs> now coming to what preoperative investigations are required in a patient is posted for surgery so these are the guidelines which are given by indian society of anesthesiologists so which is published in may 2022 so you can see all those guidelines in the indian journal of anesthesia so here in uh, these are all for the asa grade 1 patient when asa grade 1 patient is posted for minor surgery all the investigation which we need is only a complete bed count and of course the screening for hiv hcv and hvsag and if the patient is more than 45 years we need an ecg if the patient is uh, posted for major surgery then we need cbc then the serum creatine and uh, we need this lft and we also need this uh, ecg and also chest x-ray and in case of intermediate risk surgeries so cbc and serum creatinine is required electrolytes and lft are not required and when the patient is more than 45 years ecg is required and more than 50 years chest x-ray is required so validity time for normal uh, ecg is taken as uh, 12 months and validity time for normal pre-op this uh, cbc uh, rft and also lft is to, taken as two months so this is uh, uh, one of the very important slide always defer elective surgery defer elective surgery okay whenever patient has uh, got uh, myocardial infarction within two months for 30 days after uh, bare metal stent and for six months after drug eluting stent in a patient and for one month in a patient who has had this decompensated heart failure and defer elective surgery in case of patients who are having severe obstructive findings that is uh, this FEV1 is less than 50% of predicted because high risk of morbidity and also mortality and uncontrolled diabetes matter defer elective surgery and also defer elective surgery when patient is having fever and also active infection and when T3 and T4 are abnormal. So this is a list where uh, uh, what drugs we have to uh, continue and discontinue. So, all antihypertensive drugs and cardiac drugs and statins we have to continue except for ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers which have to be stopped 12 hours before surgery. And all psychiatric drugs, anticonvulsant drugs, uh, drugs related to antithyroid drugs and also thyroxine it have to be continued. And also drugs such as oral contraceptive pills, steroids and also drugs for asthma have to be continued. Now coming to this antiplatelet drugs. Antiplatelet drugs, this clopidogrel has to be stopped 
5 to 7 days before surgery and uh, prasugril has to be stopped 7 days before surgery ticagrelor has to be stopped 5 to 7 days before surgery and ticlopidine has to be stopped to 10 days before surgery insulin has to be stopped on the day of surgery in patients who are posted for minor surgeries we can give one third of the dose or half of the dose of a long acting insulin and in patients who are taking oral hypoglycemic drugs in oral hypoglycemic drugs we have to stop all oral hypoglycemic drugs on the day of surgery exception is uh, we may have to stop metformin three days before surgery in patients who are posted for major surgery where fluid shifts and hemodynamic compromise will be more and also this uh, serum uh, the sodium glucose uh, transport inhibitors uh, sodium glucose co-transport inhibitors they have to be stopped 24 hours before surgery and also diuretics these loop diuretics have to be stopped on the day of surgery and this uh, uh, thiazide diuretics can be continued and this sildenafil has to be stopped 24 hours before surgery and NSAIDs have to be stopped 48 hours before surgery because of its antiplatelet action so this is all about the preoperative evaluation of the patient whether how we have to give fitness to the patient what investigations we have to get done in the patient and uh, uh, when we have to defer elective surgery in the patient and what all the drugs we have to continue and which we have to stop on the day of surgery so, thank you